Thank you to everybody for coming uh, to our first quarterly St. Louis Neuroscience Outreach Interest Group uh, presentation of the year. We are hoping to have one of these give or take every three months or so. And we're very excited to start off this year's series with WashU's own Dr. Mark McDaniel. So Dr. McDaniel is a professor of psychological and brain sciences at WashU in St. Louis and the director of the Center for Integrative Research in Cognition, Learning and Education. So he received his PhD from the University of Colorado in 1980 and his research is in the general area of human learning and memory with an emphasis on encoding and retrieval processes in episodic memory and applications to educational contexts and with uh, our work focusing on science outreach and education, we're excited to hear from him. So his educationally relevant research includes a series of studies on elaborative study techniques and enhancing learning through testing, uh, with much of the latter work being conducted in college and middle school classrooms. So Dr. McDaniel has published over 300 journal articles, book chapters, and he's edited books on learning and memory, and he's the co-author with Peter Brown and Henry Rodiger of the recent book, Make It Stick, The Science of Successful Learning. And we're excited to hear more about his work today. So thank you very much for joining us, Dr. McDaniel. Um, and if you have any questions, please feel free to pop up or place them in the chat and you can read them yourself or I'll try to read them for you. Thanks, Katie. Uh, that, that's a great introduction. I appreciate it and a great segue into um, the foundation of what I want to talk about today. I, I, in Make It Stick, uh, Peter Brown and Roddy Rodiger and I tried to take some principles that had been earned in the laboratory, discovered in the laboratory about learning, and tried to indicate how those might be applied in the classroom. And a, and a lot of times, these, uh, the classrooms could be STEM classrooms. And what I wanted to do today is I want to distill four, what I might call pillars of the foundations of learning or four techniques that can be used to especially stimulate learning. And uh, I'm, I'm identifying these four because there's a wealth of research in, in the laboratory that suggests there's merit to these techniques, and there's increasing research that suggests these techniques produce more robust learning and memory and transfer in classrooms, including STEM classrooms. And these are techniques that I believe can be introduced into your classrooms with minimal changes to what you're already doing, and yet, I think they can give you some very uh, positive outcomes. So uh, let's get started first by considering what learning in STEM might look like for a student. So here's the learning that our students in, uh, in uh, occupational therapy program at WashU have to do in their neuroanatomy class. It's not just this, but it includes this. They've got to learn the meanings of, of a lot of terms. So here's uh, one thing that they might read, increased muscle tone in some muscles results in abnormal bent twist and so on relative to fixed posture is called dystonia. Increased tone in all muscles is called rigidity. So there's a lot of terminology to learn and, uh, and that could overwhelm students. And it seems like in this class that sometimes it does. In undergraduate biology classes, Students have to learn about digestion. So I've taken just the briefest of an excerpt from a biology textbook about uh, the initial stages of digestion. Chewing mixes food with saliva. This fluid contains an enzyme, a buffer, mucans and water, salivary glands beneath and in the back of the tongue, produce and secrete saliva through ducts to the presurface of mouth lining. Salivary amylase breaks down starch. So you can see there's a lot of information and the information is somewhat maybe, if you're not an expert, arbitrarily related. That is, from the student's perspective, lots of information they're getting can seem somewhat arbitrary. It can seem interfering. So this passage on saliva and digestion, there are a lot of little details there that for students might blur together, even though as experts, we can make the fine-grained distinctions between all those elements and they seem very differentiated to us. 
maybe not so much for students. So to try to isolate these features of kind of arbitrary nature of information to students who don't have the prior knowledge that you do, and maybe the interfering nature of the information, it all blends together. In the laboratory, we've used uh, materials like this to try to illustrate what happens when students have to learn this kind of material. So these materials um, uh, have uh, talk about a series of particular kinds of men and that, uh, that did certain things. And so the short man bought the broom and you present about 12 of these sentences to learners. I would wish I could do it as a demonstration here, but we don't have time. Short man bought the broom, the brave man gave the money to the robber, the fat man read the sign and so on and so forth. And then students are given a memory test. Now they're asked who gave the money to the robber, who bought the broom, who read the sign. And it turns out that this is really difficult. This is hard to do because basically students, the learners are forced to try to use brute memorization on this kind of material. And what I would suggest is that for many of your students, maybe especially in upper level science classes, maybe also in seventh grade science classes we've been in, students feel maybe they have so much to memorize in STEM classes and it gets discouraging and, and they don't really know what to do. So, there is a solution to this. And that is from the learning sciences, what you wanna help students do is try to reduce what seems to them as arbitrary connections between information. And how might you do that? Well, try to find ways they can relate that new information to what they already know. And one way to stimulate that is to have them answer why, try to explain, try to explain why Saliva has to mix with this for this to happen. Or other kinds of deep level questions are good too. How does this happen? What if something changed, then what would happen? So let's look at this in terms of the man sentences because it's easy to illustrate there. Um, so, oh, well, so what I wanted to say, uh, finish up with, the, the bottom line here is, sorry, bottom line here is, what you wanna do is get students to push for understanding rather than push for memorization. And you might be pushing for understanding, but oftentimes the students go home and they're studying and they're trying to memorize. So with the man senses, here's what you can do. Here's what we do in the laboratory, and now in demonstrations. You have the students or the learners build a reason, build understanding by generating a reason for why a particular man would perform a particular action. So, the hungry man got into the car. As a learner, you don't want to just memorize. You don't want to try to memorize this idea. You want to try to understand it. Why would the hungry man get into the car? Build a reason. Build a model for that. Well, you could say, well, to go to the restaurant or go to the grocery store to get food so that they can eat. That's one way to understand that relationship and make it non-arbitrary. The brave man ran into the house. Why? Try to explain, not just, don't just try to memorize. Well, because the man may be trying to save an animal from the fire, a boy from the fire, something like that. By, by elaborating with reasons why, you start to build an understanding. And when you give learners this tip for how to learn, try to generate a reason, almost all of them get all 12 sentences. And they realize that memory flows from understanding. If you build a model, memory flows from that. You don't have to try to memorize these things. But one thing I can do if for the more adventurous of you is I can share the demonstration with you. It works even with fifth graders. I've had teachers use it with fifth graders. And that they, the, the student sees how well they do when they try to memorize, which isn't very good how well they do when they try to generate a reason and build understanding, which is great. And just this demonstration can help students do better in STEM classes. We're working in a, in a ninth grade algebra class and we presented this demonstration to the students. And one student who was struggling, all of a sudden turned things around, went from a D to a B. 
And the instructor asked why. He said, well, it's because of this demonstration. It made me realize I need to understand the explanations. And it, it's been a complete turnaround. So sometimes maybe just this demonstration works. But, but that's not really my main theme here. The main theme is that the first pillar for learning is do everything you can to help students generate understanding and construct connections. Discourage them from memorizing, getting them to get them to understand. So here, the man sentences, of course, are very uh, uh, impoverished laboratory materials, and you'd want to see more before you embrace this idea. So I'll, I'll talk about two ways that you might help students generate understanding in class. First is what we've been talking about. Try to get them to explain, answer why particular procedures or steps are, are indicated for different kinds of physics problems or different kinds of chemistry problems or different kinds of math problems, or why certain concepts are related or how they're related in biology and chemistry and physics and so on. I want to, as I said, I want to show you some evidence that this is really a powerful technique. I, I don't just want to wave my hands and say, try it. I want to try to convince you this, this could be really something to help you. So first example I want to give is, is a laboratory example that I think has some very compelling results. And it is a study where students came into the lab and they were, uh, the idea was to teach them some chess principles for how to mate a king when you only have a rook and your king. And to, these are all, uh, these are all students who are naive to chess. They're taught, they're taught some of the basic moves of the king and the knight. So I'd say the rook and the king, rook and the king. And then they study moves from 10 end games for how to checkmate a king when you have a rook and a king. And there are three study conditions. One, the students observe the moves. The experimenter is making the moves on a board and the, the students observe the moves made to checkmate the king. To me, this seems similar to sometimes what happens in STEM classrooms where we go to the board and we say, here's, here's the physics problem on the, uh, the maybe Coulomb's law or something like that. And you work out and you show them the steps it takes to solve the problem. Second condition, the students observe, but they also, before the next move, predicted this is going to be the next move. And the third condition, was the condition in which the students not only predicted, but they had to explain why they thought that would be the move that is made. So now, instead of just observing a set of moves that the students may seem arbitrary, they don't know anything about chess, now they have to try to construct a reason for why you might make that move. They have to try to construct or pull for understanding. So what happens? In a test phase, students solve five different problems. They hadn't seen these problems before. They're basically still a king and a rook, and they have to checkmate a, a black king. But these are new positions they haven't seen before. And what I'm going to show you is the mean checkmates out of five problems. That is, how many problems out of five they got, they were able to succeed. And the percent of principles that were characterized by these moves. So there are some principles for checkmate at a king when you only have a king or a rook. And the moves can reveal these principles. So the researchers analyzed all the move patterns and extracted if principles were being, well, principles were being applied. Okay, so observation condition. 1.33 checkmates, half of the moves, half of the principles for this uh, kind of checkmate were exemplified in the move. So, but okay, well, these are, these are people who've never played chess before. Maybe that's pretty good. The prediction only group, but they were a little less good. I mean, there's no difference really between the two. Prediction only didn't help. Let's look at the prediction plus explanation. Look at this. That's a, that's a really meaningful, substantial advance in learning here. The prediction of self-explanation is, 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 is solving three times the number of problems that the uh, observation prediction only are, and they're embodied in those moves and their checkmates 
62% of the prisoners. So I think that's really compelling. If you just, and there's no, there's no more study time involved. The study time is all controlled, but getting students to engage and think about why you make this, you do this to solve the problem, and then you do this to solve the problem, creates much more memory and understanding and transfer. Okay, but you might say, well, okay, that's chess, but we're not teaching chess in our, in our science courses. So let's look at some, let's look at some more authentic materials. Though so we did a study with astrophysics materials where we extracted uh, short passages from high school, college textbooks on astrophysics. The passages were uh, identifying and describing basic principles in astrophysics. So one might be the conservation of uh, angular momentum. And we had one group of students just study these passages and they were told you're gonna to be tested on it, try to learn these principles. And another group was asked to study and explain why. Why in the conservation of angular momentum does an object speed up as its radius is smaller? Now we're not expecting really high level explanations, but the idea is, is they get the students to start grappling with that concept. And then uh, we, give, we gave students multiple choice tests that had both information directly stated in the passages and information that they would have to, that they could infer if they understood the construct, in this case of angular momentum. And here are the results. So on the left are the multiple choice questions that tested the facts that were stated in the passages. Even the facts are remembered better if you're trying to explain the principles. It's what I said before, memory follows from understanding. And most of us also want students to be able to learn these principles that we're teaching them. And sometimes that's tested by, by looking at inferences. And you can see on the right-hand side that the, that the answer Y group, that's the red bar, is performing better than the study only group. So just getting students to grapple with trying to explain has improved performance in this domain. Biology. There's a, now this experiment was conducted in, the cla in, a, in a biology classroom. One lab was devoted to this uh, digestion, learning about digestion. It, it involves some of the, the chapter that I showed you a little bit of at the outset. Standard learning group, they, they came in and the instructor said, look, you're, you have to learn about digestion. So we're gonna give you a chance in lab to lead and study the, the, the assignment. Another group was the why question group and they were told, We've got a worksheet here for you. It's got, it's got questions that are going to ask you to explain why. We need you to fill this in during the lab. So a question might be, saliva must mix with food to initiate digestion. Why is this true? So then the students during the course of the biology, during the semester, were given an exam. It included questions on digestion and the why question group showed better performance, significantly better than the standard learning. Okay, so basically there are a number of studies, both in the laboratory and with authentic material that show that getting students to really push for understanding helps with learning, uh, both facts, helps with understanding the concepts and transferring. Now, what's, that's not the only way, though. I like the why question technique because I think it's pretty easy to implement. But there are other techniques, too, and, and probably a lot of you use many other techniques. One that's received some attention in the laboratory is you could have students prepare to teach somebody else, prepare to teach other uh, the peers in their class. And the studies have been done in the laboratory with naturalistic materials, but not in, within a class in which even when students are told, study this because you're gonna to have to teach it to the next participant that comes in, even when that, and that, that's, that's, a, that's not really true, another participant's not gonna come in, but the student's preparing to teach rather than studying for a test, the other group's told them you're gonna to study for a test. The, the participants who are preparing to teach someone else are outperforming the participants studying for a test. So I, I you could 
tell students this. You could say, look, uh, prepare, study as if you're trying to teach somebody else, trying to teach your parents, trying to teach your brother or sister, but you could actually implement in a classroom where they're teaching somebody else. So um, again, in this ninth grade algebra classroom we're working in to, to try to get students, it, it, th this part of a, 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 a technique to help generate understanding, we divide them into small groups and they have to generate some explanations for why certain function forms as, are as they are. And then their explanations, they report out to other students, other groups. And the teacher after this, we, we developed this for one day. He said afterwards that students were excited about telling the other students what understanding they had developed. And the class was full of enthusiasm, a lot of interaction back and forth, rather than students just sitting there pretty passively in the classroom. So a lot of things, a lot of positive things evolved from that. And, and WashU, one of our, and maybe more than one, maybe Emily, who's here, is a, one of our experimental psych instructors. Um, sometimes what they've done is they'll assign certain concepts like uh, maybe within subject design or between subject design or reliability and have uh, maybe pairs of students work on that together to come in the next class and teach that to the rest of the class. So there are ways you can do this in your classroom and the evidence suggests that it's, it's uh, very powerful. In fact, I, I will admit that I, I learned cognitive psychology mostly from having to teach it. I didn't learn so much in graduate school, but when I had to teach it, I really learned. Okay, so a second pillar, a second technique, is practicing retrieval. What I mean by that? Well, what I mean is practice pulling things out of long-term memory rather than what most of us think should happen and what most students do is spending lots of time on getting information into memory. So the idea is that uh, it used to be thought that retrieval, that is a test, you're asking students to retrieve when you give them a test, that getting it out of memory is a neutral event. It doesn't do anything except show you how much the student knows. That's not true. Turns out that's not true at all. Retrieval modifies memory. It makes retrieval roots from long-term memory ro more robust, uh, more elaborate. And it probably, the evidence is showing that it probably enhances consolidation of the information into long-term memory. So the idea is spend a lot more time having your students practicing retrieval than having them review, review, review material by reading, reading, reading. So here's a laboratory study that just shows the power of practicing retrieval that was conducted at WashU by researchers here. I, I, um, okay, so I didn't, I don't have a slide for the method, but anyway, basically participants read a short passage, science passage on, on sea otters or the sun, and they studied it. And then one group studied it again. They were asked to study it again. Another group did the initial study, and then they were asked to free recall the passage. They were given a test. They were given retrieval practice. What you see in front of you now are the final free recall performances for these two groups, the study study and the study test, after a five minute delay and this would be five minutes after the initial test or five minutes after the second study. Then for an another group of students, two days later, and then for another group of students, one week later. And what you can clearly see is that after five minutes, well, lots of restudy does promote a little bit better recall than study and, and then trying to recall. And by the way, this, this initial recall test, there was no feedback in that practice test, no feedback at all. So those students aren't even being exposed to the entire text again. But two days later, things reverse. Two days later, it's much better if you study and then practice retrieval on a final test than study, study. And a week later, that even gets at the study test uh, advantage even amplifies. So here's another way to say it is that if you do repeated study for getting over as, as delays increase, Forgetting gets dramatic. So it's 35% after a week if you're just studying, study. Forgetting is much less 
robust when you've practiced retrieval. That is, retrieval is dampening forgetting. So a week later, these students are only forgetting 16% of what they could have recalled five minutes later. And this is another demonstration I give my students, and they absolutely cannot believe how much better they do a week later at recalling these passages when they've tried to do it immediately than if they just took a lot of restudy. Okay, so that, that's a laboratory experiment. This kind of thing, this idea that practicing retrieval can promote learning is easily implemented in the classroom and, and, and people are embracing this technique, but we've done some controlled studies. Of it. So in this neuroanatomy class that I was telling you about, the instructor said, well, look, we're, we're a little, we're concerned because the students are supposed to know this terminology. And then when we talk about clinical applications next year, it's as if they've ever heard of the terminology. So we said, well, let's try some retrieval practice to help learning. So what we did was we set up a lot of quiz items that were presented online and students had to complete two or three of these quizzes when the, in the first week of class, when the, in the first week when the terms were introduced. So here's one quiz item. It's just a, it's a verbatim over what I showed you earlier, where students have to, the, the dark and the bolded uh, terms, dystonian rigidity have to be recalled by the student. Those are blanks. So they get practice. And then the exam items are definition focused items. That is, and those items are identical to the quiz items. The dystonian rigidity are, are left out and they have to recall those terms. And then there's items we called conceptually focused. They haven't been seen before. They're kind of at their application type questions. Miguel has increased muscle tone in some muscles, resulting in abnormal but relatively fixed bond theorem. What movement disorders Miguel likely have? So students also have to answer those items. And, and by the way, some terms are not quizzed. So we have a control group of terms and we have an group of terms that's quizzed. And here are the results in that, in that occupational therapy class. The blue bars are the items that were given quizzes. These are just, these are just uh, quizzing to learn. They're not, a, they're not additional tests that students are getting graded on. And the orange uh, bars are the items that were not given extra, that weren't given in quizzing. But of course, the students are told you need to learn these. And you can see that the quizzing, the learning, quizzing does simulate learning, has produced final, better final test performance in the control on both definition and conceptually focused items. Okay. I don't want to stop there because you might think, well, yeah, sure. Well, retrieval practice is good for definition learning and terminology learning and a lot of this learning the students have to plow through, but it's not really our final goal. Our final goal is to get them to know about the concepts and be able to use them and analyze them and so on. Well, that can also be stimulated with testing or retrieval practice by varying the levels of the question. So we did an experiment in an intro biology class at Brigham Young University. Uh, uh, with, uh, with the lead instructor, Jamie Jensen. And she taught, so one semester, she taught two sections of her intro biology class. One section, all of the quizzes and all the unit exams were populated with questions at a low, uh, at low level of Bloom's taxonomy, a remember level. So they just had to remember the terms and Her other section taught exactly the same way. Was given exams and exa uh, quizzes, these uh, quizzes and exams that are populated with questions at higher level on the Bloom's taxonomy. These would be application questions, analyze questions, evaluate questions. And then at the end of the semester, all students are given a final exam that have both, has both new questions at low levels of the taxonomy and high levels of the taxonomy. So our interest is this, can do these high level quizzing and exams, do they produce learning that's, that is gonna show better performance on new high level questions at the end of the semester? And uh, relative to low level quizzing, 
In effect, that's exactly what you get. Look over on the right side of this figure. Those are the high level final exam questions and the high level quizzing condition outperforms the low level. But here's a cool thing. Look at the left part of the panel. Also, the high level quizzing throughout the semester produced better performance on the low level. These are the retention questions on the final. So that is having to work with these, these concepts and terms and so on on high level questions also improve people's learning of those terms and definitions. It's almost what in some views you would predict uh, in that in, in doing high level work with the concepts and so on, you have to learn them. And that's exactly what we showed here. Now, I don't have, I, I'm not gonna present the data because I wanna leave time for questions, but we've done a similar thing in middle school science classes at Columbia School in Illinois, where we, I had students do clicker quizzing every day in class. These were no stakes quizzes. The students were doing them, having tons of fun with them. And we manipulated the kinds of questions. We either had uh, definition questions or we had application questions. And uh, then on the exams that were used to determine students' grades, there were both high application questions and definition questions. We got the same result. The high level quiz questions improve the students' performances on the exams relative to low level, both for application questions, and they gave uh, equivalent performance on the, the high level practice questions, gave equivalent performance on the exam definition questions as did definition quiz questions. So it wasn't quite the same as here, but there was, but, but the high level questions promoted learning on high level exam items and gave you equivalent learning to quizzing on definition items. And the performances were better than, a, than control concepts of one quiz. So this works in at graduate school level in occupational therapy, the, bio, the uh, undergraduate level biology courses and the middle school science courses. Okay. By the way, I should say that Another real benefit of quizzing, having your students take quizzes and they can be no stakes, that is you don't have to even give them grades, although they need to do them, uh, is that students have then, we've shown in, in studies, that students are much more accurate at telling you what they know and don't know. That is their metacognition is very accurate. And as a consequence, they then can direct study to different material more strategically. That is students then, know what they need to study because they've missed them on initial quizzes and know what they don't need to spend time on. Typically what's happening with your students almost, almost certainly is they're spending time studying everything. They don't, they don't really know what they don't understand. And as a consequence, they feel they have too much to study. Well, they, they wouldn't if they had a highly accurate metacognition of what they know and don't know, then they could focus on just what they don't know and studying becomes more manageable. So a third pillar, and maybe a lot of you have heard of this because it's, it's a, it's a well-known principle from the learning lab, is that when you're reviewing and repeating material, learning is better and retention is better if you space out this review, space it out over time rather than massing it in one lesson. Unfortunately, our educational system, it, it really seems to favor the massing of information. So, I mean, I do it myself in say in uh, statistics, well, we got to cover t-tests. So we do that for two days and now we have to move on to analysis of variance. So we do that for a couple of days and we got to move on to correlation. That is all the materials presented in one mass period, either a day or a week. And we know from lots and lots of laboratory work that at least with impoverished materials that leads to worse memory than if you space the repetition out over time. And there's, that's been, I think because in the educational setting, it's maybe harder to implement spacing of review. Easier now though with, uh, with, the, with uh, computer assistance, or uh, you can do it through quizzing, you can do it through uh, bringing on questions three or four weeks from three or four weeks earlier in the semester on a current quiz. So there are ways to do it, but 
but it, I, I, there have been less studies on it. Still, the studies that have been uh, conducted are, very, I think, very powerful. So I want to show you one. This was conducted in a medical school setting with surgical residents in this particular medical school. They had 38, one year. One of the things the surgical residents have to learn is microsurgery. And in particular, in one lesson, they learned how to do microvascular surgery on a damaged artery. So the standard order of instruction here is to bring these surgical residents in in the morning at 8 a.m. And they go through a series of videos showing the surgery. They practice it on synthetic models. They get feedback from the instructor. They take a little break, two more hours. They take a break, two more hours. They take a break, two more hours. It's five o'clock and they go home and they're done. They're done with learning microvascular surgery for that, uh, that rotation. So this, the, the medical school knew, this is Rush Memorial, knew a little bit about the science and learning. They said, this doesn't, I think we can do better. So they randomly assigned half the surgical residents to the business as usual, that is the mass instruction on microvascular surgery. And the other 19 were randomly assigned to a space condition in which the, the residents came in for two hours. They got the first two hours of instruction. A week later, they got the second two hours. A week after that, the third two hours. And a week after that, the fourth two hours, spaced over four weeks. I want you to notice the instructions exactly the same. It, it, it was a very well prescribed series of instructions. Videos, practice, feedback. It's eight hours. The length is exactly the same. The sequence is exactly the same. The only thing that's changed is spacing for massive. Oh, I guess I had some. I guess I had some graphics here on this. Okay. And then. A month later, a month after the last instruction, the students come back for their exam on microvascular surgery. That's the usual thing. And they do the surgery on damaged artificial arteries, synthetic arteries, and they're scored for various things to do with suturing, margins and how tight the loops are, all stuff I don't know. And, but at any rate, they're scored on a number of dimensions and the results uh, are, were, that on, on these microsurgical drills, the space group performed better. They got higher scores in the mass group. One month later. But to me, what's really telling is that the students then had to, had to repair a damaged aorta of anesthetized rats. And the question is, did these students, did they succeed at the surgery? This is what you want them to do, be able to do surgery on a live, a live organism. So this is basically a transfer test. They've never done this on a live organism. Here are the results. What I have here is the percent failing at surgery. And you can see on the left side, the group given the mast, the standard instruction, all in one day, 16% failed at the surgery. They couldn't do the surgery. On the right, I have a little bit of red. That's the space group, just to show you I didn't forget that group. Nobody failed in the space group. So these results suggest, a small sample, but they suggest that spacing is promoting more robust, more solid, more transferable learning than is massing. And in these very important training situations, or really any training situation, uh, you, if you can arrange the instructional setting to allow more spacing, you're gonna find more retention and, and probably more transfer. I could trot out other studies, but uh, I don't want to in the, because I want you to have time to ask questions. Okay, so the fourth thing is mix more block less. What do I mean by this? Well, in lots of courses where there's problem solving, chemistry and physics and math, often problems of the same type are instructed one at a time and practice is masked, it's blocked on each individual type of problem. So here we have the case of four different kinds of solids and students have to learn to compute the volume of each one and the, the formula are different. And in an experiment done in the lab, one group was given instruction on each solid and then they did 
practice problems and then instruction on the next solid and they did practice problems. This is very similar to what happens in the classroom. The other group, they were given instruction on all the solids and then their practice was mixed up. All the solids were mixed up in practice. And then a week later, they get eight novel problems. That's two of each solid with different parameters, different heights and radii and so on. So let's first look at practice. So during the practice phase, that first session, the blockers are, are solving about 90% of these problems the mixers are struggling. They're solving about 60% of the problems. So if you're a student and you're an instructor, you're thinking, if, you, if you've presented things in blocked instruction and the students are doing practice that way, that you have really succeeded. These students have really got it. They've learned it. You ought to get a teaching award. And, uh, and why would you do anything different? Well, let's take a look at performance. It's a dramatic turnaround. A week later, the blockers are only solving 20% of these test problems. These problems aren't that different from what they saw in practice. It's just, they're just changing the dimensions, the height, the radius. Uh, yeah, they're, they're, they're floundering. Whereas the mixers, this well-earned 60% is stable. They're still solving 60%. Now you might like it to be better, but then they need more practice. So what's happening here? Well, what's happening is, in the block condition, you barely have to think. You get one problem after another that's the same solid, and you just can mindlessly, really in working, from working memory, if you will, just apply the formula over and over again. So you don't have to ever even think about the formula or whether it applies to a particular kind of solid, whereas the mixers have to keep retrieving the different formulas as they get a different kind of problem, and they have to start to learn the features of a problem that signal what kind of solution might be appropriate. When we block instruction in the classroom, we're disadvantaging students because we're completely undermining the opportunity for them to learn what features of a problem signal different kinds of solutions or steps. Okay, so I'm gonna finish with one more study very quickly because you might rightly say, well, this was just a laboratory experiment and it doesn't really have anything to do with the complexity of what I'm teaching. Well, this study was just published, just published in the last couple of weeks in the introductory physics classroom in which students are given weekly homework problems and in one uh, classroom, the homework problems are conventionally arranged. This is how they're typically arranged in math courses, physics courses, chemistry courses, one topic at a time is practice. So they get three problems of type A, three of type B, three of type C, and the next week, three of type D, three of type E, three of type F. The new condition, the mixed condition, mixes up or interleaves the practice of this topic. So on their homework, first week they get one B, one C, one A. The next week they intermix a B, a D, a C, an A, an E, and an F. And over the course of the four or five weeks, the number of problems solved from each type is equal, but in one case it's blocked and the other case it's interleaved or mixed. Now, somebody asked a question about will you get student pushback from retrieval practice? A little, you'll get a lot of student pushback from this because students don't feel they're learning much. They feel it's more difficult than mixed group. But let's see, let's see what happened in this, in this real world classroom. So anyway, they're given, okay. So after this, this homework, they're given, Two tests, one after each stage. And what do I mean by each stage? Well, each student got to experience the blocked homework. And then the second half of the experiment, ex, uh, semester, they experienced the mixed. Or other students experienced the mixed first. And the other half, they experienced the block. So every student's experiencing both in two stages. After each stage, there's a test with three novel problems. They're more difficult than in homework. And here are the results. This is. On the, on the x-axis is the, is the score on the exam, and on the, uh, on the y-axis is the proportion of students who, who, meet, who displayed that score. And what you can clearly see, that the green are the people who had the mixed problem homework or then relieved. The purple or the red is, are the people who had the blocked. And you can see that the, it, it, much more the case 
that the ones with interleaved homework in both phase one or stage one and stage two, both cases, they're scoring much better than the, uh, the distribution shows are tend to be much higher scores than those in the block. And the dotted lines are the medians of the groups. And you can see the medians are also different. So this is exciting. I mean, this is, this is really shaking up the way we usually are thinking about teaching students to problem solve in STEM. Uh, this, this is producing better learning, even though it's more difficult. And, and I think here, you really do have to get the students to embrace it because they don't think they're learning more. In this experiment, students were asked, where did you learn the most? And they all, they mostly said in the block more than in their lead. Okay, so let's see. Uh, taking stock, don't know if I have to do this, but prompt students to build understanding in STEM classes. Get them to practice retrieval. You don't have to give them any, they don't have, this is not a high, high stakes quiz. Not adding to their grade. They're, they're, they're using retrieval to learn. Try to space presentation and content, if you will, in chemistry classes at Wash U, and that's done through the quizzing. And psych, I have a psych instructor that was my postdoc who now sets aside five minutes at the end of every class to review material from previous classes. Mix up practice of related kinds of problems and concepts if you can. 